Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW group. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thanks so much for listening today. I uh, always want to remind you guys, definitely go check us out at reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, go sign up for the uh, email list. We let you know when we've got a new podcast and other stuff available. Um, go check that out, reallifepharmacology.com, and uh, you'll get a free 31-page PDF, kind of a little study guide uh, on the top 200 drugs. So really a unique resource just to kind of have um, that highlights really the most important things uh, you're actually going to see in clinical practice. And I also tried to tie in um, a lot of the things that you're going to see uh, in quizzes and exams uh, throughout your career in, in taking uh, exams, board exams in relation to pharmacology. So go check that out at reallifepharmacology.com. All right, so let's get into the drug today. Uh, citalopram is what we're going to cover. Brand name of this medication is Celexa. And if you remember, I did uh, more of a generalized overview of SSRIs, uh, but there's really some unique uh, clinical quirks with citalopram that I wanted to kind of nail down uh, and make sure uh, everyone was aware of there. So uh, mechanistically, uh, being an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, essentially this allows more action and activity uh, and allows serotonin to remain in the the synapse and cause more action. Um, And that Serotonin is well known to be associated with uh, feelings of of happiness and things of that nature. So um, with that, we anticipate that providing more serotonin uh, will help. Uh, Depression is probably the most common indication uh, I see it used for. Uh, It's also got uh, indications and evidence to support uh, the use in anxiety uh, OCD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's lots of different things you may see uh, citalopram used for. Uh, overwhelmingly, I'd say I see it used uh, for depression and anxiety when I do see it in clinical practice. Uh, let's talk about adverse effects a little bit. Uh, GI upset, nausea, that can certainly happen uh, with SSRIs in general. It can happen with citalopram. Uh, dry mouth is one that, that I have seen happen before. Uh, citalopram, so some of the SSRIs are much more uh, sedating or much more activating. Uh, I think of citalopram as kind of being a little bit more in the middle of the road where you may see patients that um, have a sedating type response and you may see patients that get an activating type response. So I, I can't really give you any specific trend there. Uh, we just have to monitor patients, make sure they're tolerating it okay. Uh, if I had a patient that really, you know, struggled with uh, insomnia, let's say, and they were staying up at night, uh, I would definitely look and make sure that medication is being uh, dosed in the day. Same thing with sedation. If it was being dosed early in the morning and the patient said they felt sedated, for several hours in the morning, maybe after taking that medication, uh, that might be a patient to do a trial uh, to switch that citalopram to the evening. So again, you want to kind of tailor what you're going to do depending upon uh, the patient response there and if they encounter um, either of those uh, potential adverse effects. Uh, Behavioral changes uh, can happen with any of the SSRIs and, and citalopram included there. Remember, there is a boxed warning uh, in pediatrics and young adults about an increased risk of uh, suicidal behavior and case reports uh, potentially supporting that. Um, So that's a good education point, um, but also a good thing 
um, to pay attention to, especially early on as we're figuring out uh, if the patient is going to tolerate this medication or not. Uh, SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, that can lead to a significant hyponatremia. And in general, citalopram on its own, at least in, in my experience, uh, I, I don't know if I've seen too many situations where it's done it on its own, um, but oftentimes it's patients that maybe have a pre-existing hyponatremia, uh, have other risk factors, maybe they're on, on other medications like a, you know carbamazepine, for example. So usually the, the significantly low hyponatremias that I've seen uh, have been more associated with patients uh, with numerous risk factors and, and reasons for hyponatremia, but it is uh, something to, to look out for. Uh, another one, uh, sexual dysfunction, that's uh, more of a class adverse effect with the SSRIs. I think I talked about that before. Um, we can look to other agents if this is uh, a significant problem. Um, again, not other SSRIs. We're probably going to look at a bupropion or maybe a mirtazapine that may have less risk uh, for that sexual dysfunction adverse effect. All right, so with citalopram, dosing is important. So usual dosage range I've seen uh, is in that 10 to 40 milligram range with a couple of caveats. So the, the first thing I think of, and this is speaking uh, to my population that I work with mostly, um, in geriatrics, in patients uh, over the age of 60, according to the manufacturer package insert, uh, the max recommended dose of citalopram is 20 milligrams. So as you could imagine, that gets difficult to try to figure out what to do sometimes if you've got a patient that has done well on a dose and now all of a sudden they're, you know, 60, 65, 70. What do we do? Do we leave them on that 40 milligrams, which maybe technically isn't recommended or do we try to do something else? So um, I guess I, I want to backtrack a second. I want, I want to talk about the risk potentially of higher concentrations of citalopram. So the, the risk, the biggest risk is association with QT prolongation and obviously uh, cardiac complications from that, which could be uh, potentially severe and life-threatening if, if bad enough there. So thinking about that patient that's uh, getting older and they're on 40 milligrams of citalopram, obviously we can think about a trial reduction and, and trying to taper down on that dose. Now that may or may not work depending upon the situation, um, but that's probably a, a good place to start as we think about deprescribing and, and making sure patients are at the minimum effective dose. Now, when that's not possible or patients maybe tried that in the past and they failed miserably and they, you know, the citalopram is the only antidepressant that works for them, um, which those situations do happen and you get, you know, painted into a tough corner. Uh, the major thing I would look at here is risk factors for QT prolongation uh, and looking at an actual EKG to see what that QT interval is. So that can give you a little bit more sense of, uh, you know, what's going on with this patient and are we putting this patient at higher risk by having them on the citalopram. If the QT interval wasn't too bad or in, you know, more of a normal range, we're, we're doing okay and, and we can probably um, continue on with that medication if we're on the higher risk end, if we're approaching, you know, 500 or higher as far as the, the QT interval goes there, um, that's definitely a, a riskier situation. So we, we've got to think about patients clinically. Um, but again, you know, trial dose reduction we can consider and EKG and, and monitoring uh, for QT prolongation risk are probably the two most important strategies that I use in trying to assess uh, what we should do about a patient kind of on a long-term uh, higher dose of citalopram. 
All right, so that's going to wrap up the first section here. We're going to finish up with drug interactions after a quick break from our sponsor. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study materials like MTM, geriatrics, ambulatory care, pharmacotherapy, or the NAPLEX exam, definitely go check out metaed101.com slash store. You'll find links to all sorts of packages as far as question banks, review courses uh, for those various exams. So go check that out. Support the sponsor uh, where you can help keep this content uh, free and educational for all to enjoy. Uh, in addition to that, if you're a healthcare professional, just looking to hone your skills, get better at, at medication therapy, medication management, um, again, go check out meded101.com slash store. Uh, we've got Amazon books. We've got links to Audible books. You can get your first Audible book for free, by the way. So, um, you know, a six to ten hour book on clinical pharmacy. Uh, you can go check that out uh, and get those links at meded101.com slash store. All right, so let's wrap up on drug interactions. And there are definitely uh, a few important ones that I think about with citalopram specifically. So first off, uh, citalopram is metabolized by a couple of uh, liver enzymes. And primarily the first one I think about is CYP2C19. So if we inhibit CYP2C19, we're potentially going to raise those concentrations, increase risk for adverse effects and QT prolongation and things of that nature. So think about that enzyme. Uh, two classic medications I think of, one is way more common than the other, and, and that most common medication is omeprazole. There's a lot of people on a generic Prilosec, okay? And it's got some drug interactions, and citalopram is definitely one of those. So it's actually recommended uh, to max out the dose of citalopram to 20 milligrams if the patient is taking omeprazole. Okay, so it's important, again, where you can get put into this clinical judgment situation where, you know, maybe you've got a patient on 30 milligrams of citalopram or 40, and they're on omeprazole as well, and they're doing okay, you know, what do we do? Well, we can certainly monitor that patient, and again, we could consider a trial reduction if they're doing well and, and things are, are going okay. Um, so I'm talking about a trial reduction of citalopram. What we can also do is a trial reduction and, and potentially, hopefully, taper off of omeprazole. Uh, in my geriatric patient population, I see that a lot, the over-prescribing of PPIs. So make sure that we actually need both drugs uh, because if we don't or if we can reduce doses or, or whatever the case may be, we can lower that risk for QT prolongation and, and uh, drug interactions there. So... Uh, cimetidine is another example of a drug that can have some 2C19 inhibition, um, but by far in clinical practice, omeprazole and citalopram is uh, the most common interaction I probably see there. SSRIs, uh, I did go through those a little bit in the, the general uh, SSRI category. Uh, we've got to remember other drugs that can increase the activity of serotonin. So serotonin syndrome is a risk. So uh, a drug like tramadol, um, linazolid, TCAs like amitriptyline, uh, MAOI is an older drug not used very often. But these are all drugs that have serotonergic activity and could uh, increase that risk of serotonin syndrome, uh, particularly in combination with uh, citalopram. Uh, bleed risk, there, this is always kind of a controversial one and a difficult one for me. Um, citalopram does and, and has been reported to have some antiplatelet type activity, so maybe some blood thinning effect. Um, how clinically significant that is, um, I would say, is probably up for debate. Now, if you've got a patient that has significant bleeding history, still having issues, um, yeah, certainly we've we've got to consider the the SSRI as well as any antiplatelets, uh, NSAIDs, uh, anticoagulants, 
all these medications that can contribute uh, to bleed risk. So it's something I look out for if somebody is really anemic or they're having blood loss or bleeding or bruising. Um, but it's, it's generally not crazy high on my radar as far as um, risks uh, go. So again, important to keep an eye on it and think about it. Um, but how clinically significant uh, it is in many situations, sometimes it's it's hard to determine and it's you know really looked at on a case-by-case basis based upon other medications and what's going on uh, with that patient there. So CYP3A4 um, in addition to 2C19 could impact uh, concentrations of citalopram and activity of citalopram. Uh, so think about some of the classic CYP3A4 inhibitors I've mentioned before. So those can raise concentrations and essentially the effects of citalopram. Now inducers uh, can potentially lower uh, the effectiveness of citalopram. So just one last kind of uh, drug interaction that I wanted to, to talk about there. And then, of course, you know, other drugs that prolong the QT interval. Um, I think I talked about several of them in the uh, antipsychotic um, podcast, but uh, definitely important to take a look at that risk. Uh, monitor EKGs if we do have risk factors for QT prolongation. Uh, and I also have an excellent um, blog post, a guest blog post that was shared uh, with me. To find that blog post, go check out QT Prolongation for Community Pharmacists Quick Guide at meded101.com slash blog. You should be able to, to find it there. A really, really excellent um, kind of breakdown of things we can look out for and things we can monitor as far as QT prolongation risk and the use of, of medication. So a, a quick plug there um, on that, that blog post, which uh, I felt was, was really helpful to kind of simplify things and um, uh, get us thinking in a, in a more clinical fashion. So uh, definitely go uh, check that out. So I think that's going to wrap it up for today. If you enjoyed the podcast, uh, do me a huge favor and leave a rating and review on iTunes or share this podcast with colleagues, friends, students, um, any healthcare professionals that you feel uh, might benefit from uh, learning a little bit more uh, about medications. So uh, I'm going to sign off for today. You can track me down at LinkedIn, Eric Christensen, PharmD, uh, BCPS, BCGP, and uh, shoot me a message there. Feel free to do that. And uh, I'll let you go for today. And, and thank you so much uh, for listening. Purchase new wiper blades from O'Reilly Auto Parts today and we'll install them for free. See better and drive safer with O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.